truth. Only one truth. With consequences. And that's the truth that I know. It's time to answer. Bash of the Beach 2000. Many stories. Brawl for all. Definitely having second thoughts. David Arquette is world champion. Publicity. Hear the real story behind the scenes of wrestling's biggest moments. The Montreal Screwjob. Only one person, and that was me. Vince Russo's Truth with Consequences. Over 25 years of abuse. With Matt Coon. Vince Russo, Truth With Consequences, is being brought to you by and could not exist without Patreon.com slash TWC. Now, what is Patreon? Patreon is a place you can go, you can subscribe for a small monthly fee, and get a lot of extra content. That means the episode you're listening to now, longer. The one last week, much longer. The one this week, much earlier. But also, bonus content little gifts, live videos, phone call from Vince, all kind of stuff. But more importantly, it's the way that you can support our podcast here. If you like what we do here, you're going to love what we do at Patreon. That's patreon.com slash TWC. Go ahead and be a member today. Welcome to Vince Russo, Truth With Consequences. Vince, how are you doing this lovely morning? I'm I'm doing good, Matt. I'm doing good. And you know, Matt, I want people to know. Can you please verify this for me? You and I do not go over anything before this show, correct? So what I'm about to say, you have no idea what I'm going to say. No, I, I, I have no idea what any of your answers will be, and I have not sent you any of the questions. Yeah, and I, and I don't want to see them, and I don't want to know. Two things I got to say up top. I went to bed last night, and I went to bed excited to do this show today. And the reason why I was excited, Matt, was because I've never really been given the opportunity to talk about the things that I really think are important that have not only been glossed over over the last 20 years, but not never even spoken about. Number two, Matt, I would say exactly what I am, um, what I'm saying to the person I'm talking about directly. There is nothing in this show I would not say to that person's face. If anybody has a problem with anything I say, if you disagree with anything I say, if you think I'm lying about anything I say, let me make this clear. Not only can you come on this show and and there's an open invite to anybody. If I say something on this show and you have a problem with it and then, you know, you, you, you block us. Or then you'll go say say stuff behind my back. There is a reason why you're not addressing me face-to-face, one-on-one, man-to-man. There is a reason why I am ready, willing, and able to do that. And the other side is not. And that is extremely pertinent when it comes to the show we're about to do. Absolutely. So if we say your name and you disagree with what we say you are invited to come on and we will do uh we will do an interview with you we will talk about it we will mediate it we will give you a fair uh a fair and open forum to discuss what your disagreements are because quite frankly vince from from where i sit it might be like in your mind you tell the truth and they lie about you and in their mind they tell the truth and you you lie about them but but the fact of the matter is as we get older, we understand that sometimes these things are just fucking misunderstandings. You know, sometimes people just need to talk. So if anybody, once again, we said blocked, we were blocked by Eric Bischoff. And I don't mind saying that. Um, but the last thing I want to say is let us do the invitation. Let us do the interaction. Because uh, as much as we appreciate all of our listeners out there fighting for us and getting the word out, it doesn't help our show for you to tag these people and to troll them. We're going to talk about Cornette today. Don't tag Cornette. Don't troll the Cornette. No, nope. you know we. Nope. I don't want. We don't to. need that. That's that's not that's not what I represent, Matt. Right. It's not what I represent, and no, I, I I I'm not on board with that, and I don't want that. Well, absolutely, and and in particular with today's show. Well, hold on, Matt. Let me just say one more thing because I, I got to clarify one thing. You said anybody. There's one exception to that rule. <laughs> It is that. 
Okay, I never want I Disco knew it. Inferno <laughs> on this show because he will tank the numbers. So w- with the exception of Disco Inferno, anybody, anybody. <laughs> you know, and, and to be honest, you know, I'm not sure how much that helps the numbers anyway, right? Yeah, that's true. Hey, real quick, though, let's talk about the Realm Network. If you want to hear Vince Russo uh, seven days a week, seven shows a week, soon to be eight shows a week. Soon to be ten shows a week. Hey, ten, my goodness, ten, bro. My goodness. Ten. And for for the price of one dollar uh, a week, you know, um, tell us about what's going on in the Realm Network. Yeah, bro, the Realm Network. See, on this show, I am the interviewee. On the Realm Network, I am the host. And, and I do five shows a week. I have a co-host, Big Vito Lagrasso, Goldilocks from TNA, Ben Hameen, Stevie Richards, The Disco Inferno, which is a different show every day. Um, We're adding a couple more shows. It's going to be 10 shows a week, bro. Less than a dollar a week. No long-term commitment. You can opt out at any time, bro. All you got to do is go to russosbrand.com and sign up to the Realm Network. And of course, the most popular show, my least favorite show, but the one I probably listen to the most, is Castrating the Marks. And you have a best of that. Uh, four your co- hours. Yeah, your co host. And I even tweeted him. I did a four hour best of Tony Schiavone once. And you don't know how many hours that takes. I think the Schiavone show took me about 100 hours. Oh, yeah. And, I know. Um, so make sure to check out Castrating the Marks, where you respond to a lot of the things that the dirt sheet writers say and, and in your own way. Yes. Let's get to the show today. And in particular, this episode is what I might say is the greatest real feud in the history of professional wrestling. It's the one that everybody talks about. And everybody's heard um, all the the bluster about it. They've heard all the emotion about it. But I think today we want to get into the facts about it, get into the history of it. And that is the entire history, the complete history of Russo and Cornette. The Hatfields and McCoys. Let's start with this. When would be? When was the first time you ever heard of or saw on TV Jim Cornette? God, probably, um, probably, man. You know, way back. I mean, when I was getting Gordon Soley from Florida, and I started seeing like you know what what WCW was and what Turner was. Uh, I I remember when he was managing the Midnight Express. I remember the scaffold match. Um, that was probably the very first time that I saw or knew of Jim Cornette. So that surprises me a little bit, Vince, because last week uh, you and I were talking on our YouTube exclusive for Truth With Consequences, and you said you were a WWF guy. So you did actually see some of the Crockett stuff going on with Cornette. Oh, yeah, and, and, and enjoyed it. And 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 literally enjoyed it and was a fan of it. I mean, I, mean, I thought Gordon Soley was tremendous i mean yeah no i saw that stuff and i enjoyed that stuff yes and isn't it looking back at that time in in crockett and knowing what you like about wrestling entertainment sports entertainment i would think that jim Cornette was someone who would pop off that tv to you as someone who was completely entertaining because he didn't just let his wrestlers wrestle they did the talking in the ring but he would get behind the microphone and and completely announce the match and put the whole thing over what did you think of cornet the the tennis racket the 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 promo ability the whole thing well i mean I, I i again to be totally honest i thought some things were corny um but i was totally blown away by other things T- to to me the tennis racket was always corny I, I i i never really got it i never really understood it you know just his appearance and you know the the way he dressed and I, I mean there was a lot of stuff that was corny were you aware of the gimmick that that Jim Cornette was a mama's boy whose yeah. mother was a millionaire who bought him a tag team and so the tennis racket was, you know, from your era, uh, you would think Mr. Fuji's cane, right? Where, uh, but, what, but why a tennis racket? Because he's a country club brat. But he 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 didn't look like a country club brat. I mean, th- this guy did not come across like he was hanging out at any country clubs. As far as his um, the ability to get his tag team over. Oh yeah, no, and but but that that's superseded by this. The only two people that I've ever met like this in my life, honestly, and you know them both, Jim Cornette and Dutch Mantel. Here's, here's 
what's amazing about these two guys, and I put them in a category by themselves. These guys are two of the of I, I don't want to say the most. They are the most, not not two of. They are the most quick-witted individuals I've ever met in my life. But it's not just that. It's the fact that their mouth can keep up with their brain. You understand what I'm saying, Matt? Like they're they Dutch and Jim are boom, 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 boom. I could never do that. I don't have their gift. The, 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 they think so fast and they're so quick witted. And what's amazing is that they, they, they verbally can keep up with that. And, and to me, that's amazing. That that's an amazing attribute, especially w- when you know how intelligent these guys are and their mouth keeps up with their brain. So that superseded. Bro, I thought the tennis racket was corny. I, 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 I didn't buy this guy belonging to it. That supersedes all that because that that's a gift, bro. I, I mean, that that's a gift. Now, we're going to get into, um, of course, wrestling philosophy, which is, strangely enough, at the core of what the disagreement is in my mind. But looking back and watching this, you had these Midnight Express uh, tag teams against the Rock and Roll Express tag teams. You also had things like the Midnight Express, as you said, versus the Road Warriors and the Scaffold. Were you able as a as a wrestling fan to look at these Midnight Express and go, wow, what a great tag team. I like what they do in the ring. Or was that not something nah, that... Nah, I, 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 Matt, you know, it goes back to the WWWF. I remember the moments. I remember the big moments. Like one thing that stands out in my mind is when Nikita join Dusty in that steel cage. Best face turn of all time. Loved it. Oh my Loved God. It. Oh, it. but see, that's what I'm saying. That's not a match that that's a moment. You know, I remember the scaffold match. That was a moment. Again, it wasn't the wrestling for me. It, it wasn't midnight express and rock and roll express. were having great matches. It was never that for me. I can remember one of my favorite things, Nikita Koloff promos on Magnum TA. When it used to be the MAGA TA, you know, with the arm. I'll, I, I'll never forget that. Bro, the greatest moment in that era, Matt, the greatest freaking moment was there was a there was a there was a a, a, a contract signing between Nikita Koloff and Magnum TA. Okay. Nikita brings Uncle Ivan to the contract signing. Who does Magnum TA bring? His mother. That's right. That's right. His mother, bro. <laughs> and, and bro, they cut the promo on t- Magnum's mother. And th- that's so that's what I always loved. You know, so whether it was WWWF or, you know, Crockett and that stuff, bro, that's the stuff I always hung my hat. Yeah, I remember it like it was yesterday, you know, Nikita, like a Magnetier. Magnetier, you know. Um, oh, I'll never forget when I worked with him at TNA and I saw him for the first time. Talk about, you know, Joe Mickety Mark. He didn't know me from Adam, bro. And I went up to him and I said, Magnetier. <laughs> and, bro, like he, he just popped. But, oh my God, I'll never forget that stuff. When you worked with Nikita in TNA, did he still use the accent? Because he's known for staying in character. Yeah, he did. Absolutely. Yes. <laughs> That's amazing. So now you've seen Jim Cornette, you get in the wrestling industry, you're working for WWF. When is the first time that you physically lay eyes on Jim Cornette? I, I think that, and again, please guys, I, I screwed up with the timeline last week. Don't, don't, don't hold me to my timelines, guys. It it was a long time ago. And, and, and to me, it's not about the timeline. It's about the story and it's about the event. I, I think, bro, I think he may have been managing Yokozuna. So he's still doing Smoky Mountain, but he's and that's coming to an end. And he's working WWF uh, with Fuji and Yokozuna. And and and, and, and the oh, heavenly absolutely, bodies. Absolutely. Uh, bringing the heavenly yeah. bodies in yes. to, uh, uh, to wrestle yes. the Steiners and all that kind of great yes. pre-attitude era of WWF. Okay, so... You lay eyes on him. He's a talent. Um, at some point, he starts to kind of become more and more of a backstage figure. When was the first kind of, um, well, when did Jim Cornette become more than an on-air talent in WWF? This is the stuff that people don't know. Okay. We got to go back to the beginning. Okay. So what is the beginning? The beginning is, Matt, we're talking about 
mid nineties. This is all my opinion, Matt. This is all my opinion. Okay. It was a stretch where I thought the TV product was horrible. And I can't tell you, Matt, how difficult it was for me to be working in that office and feeling like the WWE product at that time was just atrocious. I mean, I, and I'm talking as a wrestling fan now. I, I, I it, 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 it was bad. It, it, it was not enjoyable. It was so 1970s. They weren't evolving. They weren't growing with the times. It was so bad to me, Matt, that I... As the editor of the magazine, I used to shoot my own angles in the magazine. The, you know, stuff that was not happening, was not true, was not going on on TV. Bro, I was doing that to keep myself entertained because I was not going to write about freaking Mantar. I, I, I mean, I, I just wasn't going to do it. Okay? Right. There was a lot of things going on in this period. A lot of corny characters. Um, we're talking the early days of Raw, right up into the early days of Raw. You know, your Mantor, your Aldo Montoya, your Bastion Booger, your Duke the Dumpster Droshi, your Envy, all that, all that stuff. You had who? Who was supposed to be some kind of a knock on Hulk Hogan? I mean, to really get the um the understanding of that, you'd have to ask Bruce. Like that that was literally Bruce's era. Um, but anyway And who was played by the recently departed Jim the Anvil Nightheart, right? Yes, yeah. This was when for me it was like like, like, are you effing kidding me? This is when I started going into business for myself. Matt, all the big wigs used to be on the second floor of Titan Tower. You know, Vince, Bruce, Pat, you know, that's where everybody, the main guy. The magazine was on the second floor. So basically what used to happen is creative would come up with, okay, we're bringing this guy in and this is who his character is going to be. Then they used to get what creative services explain the character to them. The first thing creative services would do would be they would render drawings of the characters. Okay. The woman that used to do this, her office was right next to mine on the second. Right. I went right. in there one day and she was working on the character. What, what was going to be whose tag team partner. And when I saw that, I was like, seriously, to be clear, though, a lot of these ideas, a lot of this influence at this time was Bruce Pritchard, right? He was involved. I, I, I don't know who came up with what. I, I don't, and, and I don't mean, I don't mean, I don't mean that. But I didn't say that on purpose. He was involved in the creative process. Okay. So now, Matt, an interesting thing uh, begins to happen. Pat Patterson wants to retire. Bruce and Pat were the creative, and they work with him. So they bring in. Bill Watts. They put his office on the second floor. They don't put Bill Watts up with them on the fourth floor. I'm working on the second floor. So Bill Watts was was the first one kind of brought in when Pat decided he wanted his role to diminish a little bit. I think when Vince was going through that steroid trial and they didn't know what the outcome was going to be, Jerry Jarrett was brought in and Jerry Jarrett was going to play a bigger role. Bro, I cannot tell you how much fun they used to make about, to, about Jerry Jarrett behind his back. I mean, freak. I have an idea. Yeah. Okay. So, you know, I'm not making that up. I mean, no. Bruce had a field day with freaking Jerry Jack. Yeah. And I know you're not a podcast listener, but a lot has been made of Bruce's impression of Jerry Jarrett over the years <laughs> of something to wrestle with. And it's tremendous. Bruce and Pat just tortured Jerry and Bruce went around talking like Jerry to Vince. And so, bro, Jerry was so soon out of the equation. The, the next person brought in was Cowboy Bill Watts. Bill Watts is on the second floor. I'm on the second floor. When Bill Watts came in, he would sit himself in the conference room on the second floor and just study tapes of what was going on on WWE programming. Me being me, this is Bill Watts. I, I knew of Bill, you know, but, you know, again, I wasn't the wrestling mark and I knew all these territories, but I knew who Bill Watts was. Yeah, Bill, to, to give a little background for those who don't know Bill Watts, he's the epitome of what an old school promotion was. He was the top guy. He also ran the promotion. He owned the promotion. Mid-South Wrestling was associated with the NWA at the time, and he actually was ousted uh, from WCW due to some comments he made about uh, race. He's in there in the in the conference room, and you know me again, just being very very respectful to people that were in the wrestling business before me. Um, I went in the conference room. I introduced myself. Bill Watts asked me to take a seat. 
And, uh, you know, as he's watching, he's asking me a bunch of questions and I'm being totally honest what my opinion is. And this kind of becomes routine. I had zero ambition of writing TV, being involved with TV. I had no intention on wanting to be a part of TV. Like I was totally happy. I'm a journalist. That's what my degree is in. I was totally happy with the magazine. So, you know, this kind of got to be like a routine. Bill turns around one day and he goes, how would you like to sit in with the creative team? Matt, I didn't even know what that meant. I, I, I didn't even know what that meant. And I was like, well, you know, what do you mean? And he goes, well, me, Pat and Bruce, you know, we get together and we write TV and we discuss TV. How would you like to sit in on that? I said, yeah, I mean, sure. I mean, if, if you want me to do that, like, I'll, I'll be happy to do that. Right. But as a creative guy, though, even though you're, you're saying you're not ambitious, but as a creative guy, there wasn't a little part of you that thought, wow, I would like my creativity to be expressed no, in a bigger there, way. No, there really wasn't, Matt. If, if there was, I would say so. There really wasn't. I, I, I wanted to help because I thought the product sucked at the time. So in your mind, you're just another guy with an opinion, but you're, you're sitting down with Bill Watts and Bill Watts is, is thinking enough of your conversations where he said, hey, sit in on this meeting with us. Yes, exactly. So uh, uh, the first meeting, I'll never forget it. Um, the first meeting was at Pat Patterson's house. And it was me, Pat, Bruce, and Bill. And Matt, all I did, I was a fly on the wall. Like I sat there and said nothing. Matt, I go to one meeting, one meeting with them, one. All of a sudden, you know, back in the office that same week, Bill Watts calls me in his office, says, Vince, shut the door. Okay. I shut the door. Bill said to me, Vince, I have not been able to get a hold of Pat. I have not been able to get a hold of Bruce. I have not been able to get a hold of Vince. Nobody is returning my calls. Vince, I'm done. Th that's how smart Bill was. I mean, he'd been around the block. He knows how it works. Were you aware of, uh, you know, in, even sitting in the meetings, was it a thing where maybe – uh, they didn't respect him or they weren't listening to him or was there talk around the office that, that he wasn't working out or anything like that? Not, I, not that I know of, but you know, but, um, Matt, if I had to guess it's, it's just a power thing, you know, it's just, you know, Bruce and Pat were doing it for so long. All of a sudden bill comes in as you know, their, their boss, like they're gonna, they, they, they're gonna get in Vince's ear and it, it, it's, it's not going to work. And, you know, Bill, Bill wasn't mad. He wasn't upset. He just wanted to let me know because he kind of brought me in. Sure enough, next day, Bill Watts is gone. Bill Watts is gone. So, like, now, like, I don't even know, like, okay, like, I guess that's it. Here's where Cornette gets involved. Watts exits, okay? Pat still wants to retire. Jim Cornette is brought in to write with Bruce. So now it's now it's Bruce and Cornette. So the position, as uh, unlike before, it sounds like Vince is looking for a guy to be his next Pat, which is someone who's a little bit older, someone with a lot of experience in the industry. Uh, Jerry Jarrett, you know, well, you know, doesn't work out. And then Jim Ross, uh, or not, excuse me, say, <laughs> yeah, that Freudian slip, Bill Watts didn't work out. And now they bring in Jim Cornette, but Jim Cornette's not brought in the same position. He's brought in as a writing partner uh, to Bruce. Yeah, I, I don't know what the pecking order was. I don't know who had what title, but all I know it was Bruce and, and um, Jim. I don't know where I am. I'm in no man's land, okay? It's Bruce that turns around and says, you're going to come sit in with me and Jim. Bruce could have clearly said, Listen, you know, you know, Bill Watts brought this guy in. Listen, I don't think much of him. Let let him write the magazine, blah, blah, blah. Bruce, let me continue to sit in on creative with him and Jim. So the meetings at that time, you know, it's pretty hilarious. Talk about a fucking table for three. You've got Vince Russo, Jim Cornette, Bruce Pritchard. Pat is not around or Pat is around? Pat is not around. And uh, Vince, uh, is Vince in on these meetings as well? No, no, no. I I'm only going to the meetings with Jim and Bruce at Bruce's house. Okay. W w I don't go to the Vince meeting. I'm, I'm just meeting with these two now. 
And this is in Stanford, right? This is in Stanford. Was these were these macro meetings where you're talking about concepts to pitch yeah. Vince? Let me tell you about this again. This is the shit, bro. Nobody talks about because you got to be there to know this. So th- okay? this is a, a, I'm sorry, but this is fucking amazing to me. It is amazing. It because is because you've got Jim Cornette, Vince Russo, and Bruce Pritchard throwing ideas at each other and brainstorming with each other. That's not true. Not no? true. Not true. Okay, so what was it? I knew my place, Matt. I didn't say a word. I didn't say I had to earn my stripes. I didn't say a word. I had to learn. I had to know what the freak I was. I I, I was not the Vince Russo then that you know now. I was like, I don't know how to do this. I'm going to keep my mouth shut, and I'm going to learn from what you guys are doing. I think the Vince Russo now would do okay. I'm not sure about the Vince Russo 20 years ago. but um. Yeah, that's true. (laughs) But, Matt, here's the thing. And, and again, I'm going to put it all out there. When they were they were um, formatting the shows, there was literally a sheet. Segment one, vignette. Segment two, vignette. Segment three, vignette. And Bruce just went, and it was a pad of the sheets. Bruce just went down the sheet and filled in the blank. What was your first impressions of Cornette? This is the first time you're really uh, Matt dealing with him. Matt, I'm, I'm going to be honest with you, and this is where, bro, you can call me an a-hole. You can call me like whatever you want. They're writing these shows, and I'm I'm uh, I'm sitting back and I'm listening and I'm not saying anything. But this is what I'm saying to myself: Do you guys not realize that as you're putting this stuff on the paper, it sounds horrible? Like, do you do you not see that? Like what you're writing on that sheet of paper, which is going to be the TV show, it's effing horrible. It's horrible. Okay. I, I'm just being honest with you. And I don't, I don't, I, you know, Bruce will probably listen to this show. And I'm sorry if I'm offending or upsetting Bruce. That's how I felt. This is the process for a while. Me and Bruce are becoming friends, but there was always that part of me that. What's the whole thing about keep the friends close? What is that gimmick? Keep your friends close. Keep your enemies closer. I, I, I always felt there was a level of that. Bruce Pritchard is no dummy. Yeah, so I'm very careful. But Matt, I'll never forget. Bruce invites me over to his house to watch the pay-per-view when Hogan is revealed as the third guy of NWO. Matt, I remember sitting there watching this with Bruce at his house, and I'm saying to myself in my head, we're dead. Like, we're dead. I knew what Bruce and Cornette were writing, and I was watching this, and I was like, we are effing dead. I knew it the minute Hogan came out, that ring was filled up with litter and cr- garbage and crap. And I'm like, bro, we're dead. Like, we are absolutely dead. They're starting this NWO thing. Cornette and Bruce are writing 1970s wrestling. Are you the only one who realized it? Like, you're saying you're dead. But was Bruce like, shit? Or was he no. just like, okay, let's see what we can do now? I don't think they realized the the change. The massive, massive change. Now, they're writing their stuff. I'm watching the NWO. I want to be a part of that. I want to be a part of that. That's that's what I want to be a part of. Bro, I talked to some of my good friends at WCW at the time. Think about how much history would have changed. Think about this. One late night, I get a call from Eric Bischoff. Never talked to Eric in my life. Now, here's my my very first impression of Eric Bischoff. Go ahead. Bro, this is the most arrogant okay, asshole I've ever spoken to in my life. My very first. Right. But here's what I said to myself, Matt. I says, you know what? To his defense, he's got every reason to be arrogant because he's rewriting the game. And to his defense... We yeah. talked about Bischoff a lot last week, and he blocked us last week. But to his defense, you're saying right now that Eric Bischoff and his ideas inspired you. Yes, without a shot, I have no problem saying that. And I, I even said to myself, this guy's got every right to be arrogant because he's he's changing the game, right? So I, I just remember like 
you know, he was very arrogant to me. I remember one line him saying to me, well, yeah, I don't care where good ideas come from. I don't care if they come from a janitor or whatever, but it was the old, I'll get back to you. I hang up the phone with Eric. Linda McMahon was my boss. I said, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to schedule a meeting with Linda. Here's why I wanted to schedule a meeting. I wanted to ask her one question and one question only. If all you think that I'm capable of is writing the magazine and I can't help this company out in any other way, if that's all you think I'm capable of, I need you to tell me that. And if her answer would have been, that's all I think you're capable of, I would have proceeded. Okay. So there was a shift because uh, just a while ago, you said you had no ambition to write on TV. It wasn't a creative impetus for you, but all of a sudden now after seeing uh, the NWO and seeing what they did in WCW. Now you want to watch, you want to do more. I want to right? do more. I, because I, I I'm excited and I'm inspired. I was inspired by WCW and NWO and what those guys were doing. They were changing the wrestling business. This is where the wrestling business needs to go. I want to be a part of that. And what was, uh, what did Linda say to you? Okay. So, so that was my intention. I'm going to go in and I'm going to ask you the question. Matt, I go in Linda's office. I sit down before one word came out of my mouth. Guess who comes walking in the office? Vince McMahon. Now Vince sits down, doesn't say a word. And I'm like, and I'm saying to myself, bro, I'm, I'm going to say what I want to say. And I'm going to ask the question. I'm glad he's here. I'm glad he's here. Like, seriously, like, I'm glad he's here. I'm glad I got them both. So, bro, I proceed to ask the question. Linda, if all you think I'm capable of is writing a magazine, I need you to tell me. Vince gets red in the face. Who do you think you are to come in this office and ask a question? He went off. Matt, I don't know if I was naive or I don't know if I was stupid, but I sat there and I'm listening to him and I, I didn't get nervous. I didn't get intimidated. Nothing. I just said to him after he, you know, gave a speech, I said, Vince, I just want to help you. I said, this isn't about money. This isn't about a, 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 a you know, I just want to help you. That, that, that's all I want to do. So I left the office that day. It was a Friday. I don't know. Is this guy going to fire me? Um, I don't know. Like I literally don't know. Cause he was pissed off that Monday. I'll never forget it. The raw was half in the United States, half in Europe. Okay. If you remember, I think, I think Owen had a match with bulldog. I think the show was horrible, Matt. Absolutely effing horrible. Okay. I get in the office the next morning, like eight o'clock. I always went in early. I always got in early. I get a call from Vince's assistant, Beth. Vince wants to see you up in his office as soon as possible. And to, to be clear, that raw was written by the Pritchard Cornette team. Yeah. yeah. And you were sitting in on those meetings and knew that it was not good. Yeah. Yeah. So now as I'm going up the elevator, I'm like, okay, the show was the absolute shits last night. I had that meeting with Vince on Friday that did not go so well. I'm kind of going to be like the scapegoat and like I'm literally going up there to be fired. So I'm contemplating my future in the elevator. I got to go from the second floor to the fourth. What am I going to do for a job? You know, I've got kids now. What the frig am I going to do? Like I, in my mind, I was 100% fired. Okay. So Matt, I go up in his office and, and, and Beth opens up the door and lets me go in his office. Every seat, every single minion is sitting around the round table. It is Vince. It is Pat. It is Bruce. It is Cornette. Um, I don't know if Jr. was at there at the time. It was Shane. It was, they were all there. No, no wrestlers were up there though. No, 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 no. This was Vince's inner circle. Okay. So now I'm like, okay, now I'm like, bro, I'm processing all this. And I'm like, now I'm like, okay, Vince is going to make an example out of me. 
You know what I'm saying? Now he's he's got an audience now. Let's let's make an example out of the magazine guy. And I, bro, I'm 100% confident this is going to happen. Okay? Vince has the freaking raw magazine in his hand. He's got it in his hand. Okay? He's at the head of the table. Everybody's sitting around. I I he tells me to sit down and I'm like, "Okay." takes that magazine, slams it on the table and says, this is what our television show needs to be. Matt, I'm, I'm, I'm in shock. You talk about, I totally expected it to go the other way. I never saw this coming ever. Um, I, so there's two sides to that. The first side is, wow, how validating it is. What a surprise it is. This guy you respect and this thing you wanted to do, it looks like you're going to get to do. At the other side, you've got a guy who is uh, kind of an outsider coming in that has ideas. Not ki- not kind of, not kind of an outsider coming <laughs> Certainly in. Certainly compared to everybody else in the room. And, and I, I know right there, I know right there, like, bro, like Vince, like, you know, na- now it's all starting to sink in. Shane's bringing me on the side and Shane's telling me you're coming to every TV and blah, blah, blah. But now I'm realizing, bro, these guys, like you talk about having a freaking target on your back. Like these guys are going to absolutely freaking hate me. I, I, I knew that immediately. Because it was as much of a, uh, you know, vote of confidence it was in you. It was uh, an indictment of the creativity that had been taking place at the time. And not only that, I, I, I'm an outsider. You you know, with wrestlers, the first thing is like, oh, who did this guy ever beat? He didn't pay his dues. He didn't do this. He wasn't selling programs when he was 12. You, you know what right. I'm saying? I'm like, I know now, like these, with what Vince did, the, these guys absolutely hate me now. Like I, right, I, right off the bat. I know I got it. I understand. So, you know, the show is Cornette, right? And so Cornette is in that meeting with you. Um, what is your relationship like with Jim Cornette at the time? Do you have any relationship there, with him? There really isn't one. But here's what happens now. J.J. Dillon goes to WCW. Okay? Bruce wants that job. Okay? Director of Talent Relations. Bruce wants that job. Okay? Okay? Bruce gets that job. Um, but I'll never and Bruce think. was head of creative, yes, right? Yes. And he gets moved to talent relations. Yeah, yeah I'll never forget. And then, I'll never forget. He moves to a bigger office, and his wife Stephanie was there. And the first day they're, they're doing that whole office, that feng shui gimmick. I'll never forget that to bring Bruce luck. You know, the desk was faced right. this way, and like, okay, well, Bruce wanted that job bad. Okay, so. Now let's look. Now we're down to me and Cornette. Right. We're down to me and Cornette. There's there's me and Cornette and Vince. That's it. Down in creative. Creative. Okay. Right. So a couple of things start to happen. Um, I'll never forget this either. And th- th- a lot of these things will wake up calls. A lot of these things will freaking wake up calls. Matt, something goes desperately wrong with Bruce in that position. And I don't know what it was. I have no idea. But, bro, he lasted in that position for for maybe a couple of weeks. I think he has said it wasn't a good fit for him. Yeah, and I don't know what happened. I don't know. It wasn't on my radar. But here's what I do know. All of a sudden, I get... Bruce calls me in his office and he goes to me, Vince, I was talking to a Debbie Bonanzio. Debbie Bonanzio was creative services, which was the department right next to mine. Okay. I I worked with these people every day. I was not on the fourth floor. I work with these people every day. Bruce says to me, Vince, I was talking to Debbie Bonanzio and Debbie told me that, man, they, she just can't work with you. Like, you know, they, they, they just can't work with you. I, Matt, oh, like that is total effing bullshit. Like, are you freaking sick? I've known these people, bro, from the first day I said foot in the building. What the F are you talking about? Like, Bruce, like what, what, like, what are you talking about? Right? Well, Vince, I'm just telling, I'm just the messenger. They said, you're very difficult to work with and they can't work with you. 
get, what, what, what would I do next? Me being me, you, you know, me being me. You go right to the source. I go right to Debbie Bonanzio. And I said, Debbie, like, if, if I did anything wrong, if I was disrespectful, like if I did anything with, with all my heart and soul, like I apologize, like, I'm sorry. Debbie. And she looked at me, she goes, what are you talking about? And I said, Debbie, I just left Bruce's office and Bruce told me that you told him I was, she goes, Vince, I never had any kind of conversation like that with Bruce where I said that about you. Like that never happened. And I knew she was telling me the truth because I had a relationship with her. So what's the next thing I do? I tell Vince and I said, Vince, I'm going to be honest with you. You brought me in here because you, you want me to do this job and I will do this job for you. I said, but bro, I'm not playing these games. I'm not that that's not me. I don't play politics. I'm not interested in power. I'm not I, I, I'm not doing this. And I told him what happened with with Debbie. I said, Bruce said this to me. I knew he was full of shit when he said it. I went to Debbie. Debbie said she never had any kind of no such conversation with Bruce. All Vince looked at me and said to me. I'll take care of it, pal. That's all he said, bro. From that day on. Bruce never, ever bothered me again. The politics from that day going forward were over. I was successful at the WWE, bro. It, it wasn't because Vince was my filter. The reason I was successful at WW, w, WWE and I had problems other places was because Vince had my back. And, and, and it was known, you F with Vince Russo, you're effing with me. I never had to worry about politics. I never had to be worried about being stabbed in the back. I was just allowed to do my job because Vince had my back 100%. But you were just hated by everybody else around you. I mean, you know, uh, Pritchard probably turned ice cold towards you. Um, Cornette at this point probably thinks you don't know anything about wrestling because yeah. you know, you've got the raw magazine going and that's what he wants to do. Yeah. Um, I, I re let me add to that. Let me add to that. And I'll never forget this. I, re I remember like one of the first TVs when I started writing, bro, I swear to God, I remember Pat Patterson, who I love, love, love to freaking death, bro. He literally came up to me after like the, the, the production meeting when the whole show was laid out, he came up to me and he just laughed. He like because this style of wrestling he had never really seen, and he just, he didn't say nothing. He just laughed. So like I knew, bro. But but keep keep in mind, bro. This is very similar to WCW. I go into WCW with a big target on my back. I've got I've got nobody's got my back. Nobody's got my back. So I'm buried. Like I'm freaking buried. With Vince, he made it clear. I've made this decision. I'm going to give this, I'm going to give this guy a chance. Don't F with him because if you F with him, you're, you're refing with me. And because of that, I could concentrate on doing my job. Your job is writing TV. And at this point in time, you're writing TV with Jim Cornette. What is that relationship like? What is that process like? That couldn't have lasted for very long. There was never, a, there was never, there was never a one-on-one -on -one with Jim Cornette writing TV. It was me, Cornette, and Vince. So when you're saying things like, let's take the wrestling book and rip it up. Let's we're, we're, let's not do anything we've done in the past. Let's do the opposite. You're saying these things in front of Cornette. What is Cor Cornette's reaction to this? We're, we're, we're spending a lot of time arguing in those meetings. I'll give you the perfect example. I'm talking about Vince. Throw the effing handbook out the window. We need to go the other way. Shades of Grey. You know, every character is different there, there, there is th not one person in this world is a good guy all the time or a bad guy all the time. Good people do bad things and bad people do good things. Stop with the baby face and heel bullshit. At the same time, Cornette is pitching. We were introducing a new character. I don't even remember who it was. And Cornette Cornette's pitch was, OK, let's have a box out there for like four weeks in a row. All of a sudden, th these are his exact words, bro. And I, and I, I, I again, let, let me clarify if he has a problem with anything I'm saying, as I've said a million times before, Jim, anytime you want to have a conversation with me here, your show, 
in an open forum, whatever you want to do, bro, because this stuff happened. So he said, let's have a box out there for four weeks. All of a sudden, out of the fourth week, whatever, this so-and-so comes out of the box because everybody knows when you come out of a box, you're over. Now, we've gotten kind of deep in the show with some fascinating stuff, and we've barely gotten to Cornette yet, but that's coming up soon. But before we do, let me tell you that t-shirts are in. We have some great t-shirts brought to us by our good friends at What For Apparel. Now, to get one of our t-shirts today, and you're going to love these shirts, all you have to do is go to shirtsoftruth.com. That's shirtsoftruth.com, which has something I think is kind of becoming an iconic logo. Me and Vince hooked up to the lie detector machine. We've got Russo Coon 2020. We've got an I Believe Russo shirt. We've got a great TWC shirt featuring all three fonts of the three companies that Vince worked with. And I don't know who wants this. I know Conrad Thompson doesn't, but it's I'm a Matt Coon guy. We've also got the FMK shirt. And I don't know if you know this, but it stands for Matt Coon. And we've got the Bischoff inspired nwo style block shirt because of course we are russo club and from last week we have the wonton bomb brother and that is available in the hulkamania colors go to shirtsoftruth.com today support the show show your colors show your part of team truth with consequences go to shirtsoftruth.com today have you heard bruce's impression of that exact quote no i have not <laughs> No, it's no. a very high pitched. He's like, "You come out of a box, you're over, motherfucker." <laughs> to show you how that makes sense, and to show you where Vince's head was at, do you remember how Terry Funk was portrayed? And the first time we saw him on WWE TV, he came out of the box with the chainsaw. <laughs> that was Vince. That that was one hundred percent Vince's rib on Cornette. Okay, bro, you want Terry Funk in here? No problem, bro. We're gonna hire Terry Funk, and I'm gonna have him come out of a box. That's exactly what that was. That's exactly what that freaking was. So, so, bro, like I'm, uh, these meetings are going on. I'm pitching without even knowing it at the time, Matt. I'm pitching Attitude Era. Jim Cornette is pitching guys coming out of boxes where we're, we're spending a lot of time arguing in those meetings. Now, th this is one thing, Matt, th this is this is this is this is the place, I think. Where a lot of people like to say I'm a liar, I'm full of shit, I'm this, I'm that, because nobody thinks this way. Nobody thinks this way. If you're in the wrestling bubble, you don't think this way. When you worked for CBS before having this job, when you had your own business before having your job, you know, bro, the number one thing is what's best for business, what's best for the company, not how does this benefit me the most? How do I get the most power out of this? The most important thing is Vince McMahon is signing my freaking paycheck. The most important thing to me is I need to be loyal to that man and I need to tell him what's, what I think is best for his business. But let's be honest here. There is a sense of ego involved because you have been, you know, given that seal of approval by Vince publicly. So you're not just thinking I have to give him my best ideas, but you're actually at this point thinking, my ideas are good ideas. My ideas are going to work. Your ideas are old school. They're not going to work. Yeah, but that my 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 attitude is I am 1,000% confident, Matt. This is what we need to do. This is where we need to go. And I'm also saying to myself, Jim, shut the F up. Like, bro, like, come on. Like, bro, you, you're so wrong. Like, we, you, you and Bruce were doing that, and we're getting killed. So, yes, that that's that's what I'm saying eternally. Yes. So a lot of Cornette's criticisms of you come from this point where Vince Russo doesn't know shit about the wrestling business. Vince right. Russo doesn't respect what we do in the wrestling right. business. Vince right. Russo doesn't know anything about what made this business great. So let me ask you this. Yes. Is it possible that both of you, not just you, but him, could have done a little bit better to integrate both ideas? Like you didn't have to burn the town completely 
yourself, you know, creatively. I, di- I did that. I, I did that. Remember the NWA angle? Right. That's why I did that. I'm like, okay, Jim, w- listen, w- we're going to do it. Here, we're, we're going to do this, and you are going to see firsthand nobody is going to give a flying F. So we're going to do this. You're going to put your NWA together. We'll bring rock and roll in. Jeff Jarrett becomes a part of that tradition. Oh, We're going to do that, and I will show you firsthand in 1996 or 1997, whatever it is, people don't give a shit about this. But I guess what I'm saying is, do you think maybe you have a little bit more respect for uh, traditional wrestling ways than Cornette gives you credit for? Like, you can take some elements that definitely worked. This, 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 this has been the problem with Jim Cornette everywhere he's gone. And we're going to get into Here is the problem. Okay? He's stubborn. He's never going to change his ways. He believes a certain way. He's not going to change with the times. This worked, you know, this worked in, 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 you know, this worked at Crockett. This worked at OVW. This is going to work today. No, no, it's not, Jim. I, I mean, television shows from 1973, any television show from 1973 is not going to work in 1997, bro. It's 25 years after the fact. In these meetings, you know, you're, you're coming up with ideas is every idea you come up with argued with him or sighed about or boo boo faced by him or? Oh or- yeah, it's it, that, that, that's what I was getting to, Matt. We're spending so much time arguing in, the, in these meetings, and Matt, like, I'm I'm saying to myself, like, bro, th- this is not good for the company. Like, we're, we're wasting so much of the company's time arguing. We're wasting. It, it's embarrassing arguing in front of Vince. Like, it's it's freaking embarrassing. So. Was he, I, 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 I'm sorry, real quick, these these yeah. arguments, was he like, you know, the cornet we think about? Was he yes. losing his temper and motherfucking yes. you and all that stuff? Yes, 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 yes. And I'm just sitting there saying this is not good for the company. This, this is a total waste of Vince's time. Like, this is this is freaking ridiculous. So I go to Vince's office, Okay. Bro, I know I got a Bible somewhere close by, and I will put my right hand on it, and I'll get it. I'll get him out if you want me to. No, get we're good. But I said, I, I said exactly what I just said. I said, Vince, this is ridiculous. We can't waste the company's time this way. This is a massive waste of time. It's a massive waste of your time. Okay. Vince Russo, Jim Cornette are never going to get on the same page, bro. We're, we're, it, we're not. We're not. I said, so Vince, this is exactly what I said, Matt. I said, Vince, if you want to go with Jim Cornette, like that's fine with me. Go with Jim Cornette. I'll go back to doing the, you know, I, I was still doing the magazine. I said, I'll, I'll, I'll go back to doing the magazine, bro. I swear to God, Matt, it was like, bro, as long as I don't lose my job, I don't give a shit. I'll do the freaking magazine. You'll continue to pay me. I'll be happy doing the magazine. But I said, if you want to go with Cornette, Bro, go with Cornette. I'm fine with that. I'll do the magazine. I'm getting paid. I don't have an issue with that. Okay? That's exactly what I – bro, you don't give Vince McMahon ultimatums. I mean anybody who knows Vince McMahon, you don't give Vince McMahon ultimatums. If I would have said to Vince McMahon, Vince, it's Jim or me, Goodbye, Vince would have said, okay, well, I'll take Jim. You, you right. don't give Vince McMahon ultimatums. You don't. And at the same point, you probably, even though we think of Vince Russo as Vince Russo now, you probably weren't a thousand percent secure in your position where you thought, well, I, I, I'm in a position where I could actually say, you no, know. No, not at all. I, 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 it, it was just, it was, it was frustrating. It was a waste of time. It was childish and it was like, I'll go write the magazine again. Like seriously, like I'll, as long as I still had my job, that's all I cared about. And Vince is no dummy. So Vince is looking, he's in these meetings too, you know, and he's probably going, you know, he he probably doesn't have to be convinced too hard that this Russo Cornette alliance for writing is not going to work out. Exactly. So he listened to me, didn't say nothing. Okay, Vince, that's how Vince is. Okay, Vince, thank, thank you. You know, and I left. Next schedule meeting at his house. That's where we wrote Jim Cornette is not there. 
That's it. That's it. Now, so that's where the problem starts with Cornette. To, to Jim Cornette, I cost Jim Cornette that spot. No, Jim, I didn't cost you that spot. You cost you that spot. Vince McMahon, the boss, made the decision. The fact that you wouldn't bend, the fact that you were being so stubborn, you cost yourself that spot, not me. When you're going, you go to Vince and you say, it's not going to work the two of us. You and Cornette are arguing. Now, you and Cornette are arguing a lot. Did you ever approach Cornette and say, no. hey, man, no. we got to figure out how to work together? I knew we couldn't. And, and the reason? We, 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 we were on such opposite right. spectrums, Matt. Like, and, and not only that, I mean, we were on such opposite spectrums, and he was so damn stubborn and set in his ways. There was, there was no way. There was j- Jeff Jarrett tried to repeat that 20 years later, and the result was the same. With the benefit of hindsight and the benefit of maturity, do you think there's anything you could have done differently to have made that situation more tenable for the company? No, no, absolutely not. I mean, I could have had that discussion with Cornette that you're talking about, but he 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 would have never changed. Cornette is no longer in the meetings. What are your interactions with Jim Cornette? After that, if any, there really isn't any, I mean, I mean, he didn't lose his job or anything. You know, I mean, it's not, it's not that Jim Cornette got fired. He was still managing, I think, and he just wasn't writing. But when you work with somebody, you know, when something's not right, was the scuttlebutt or was, you know, the, the vibe you got that like Cornette now hates me more than ever. No, I, I mean, bro, first of all, when I went there that day and Cornette wasn't there, Vince didn't even address it. We never talked about it. So Never. who's taking Cornette's place in the meeting? Nobody. It's me and Vince. It, That's it. You and Vince. Fast forward 20 years later, we got 79 riders. That's it. It was me and Vince. That's it. That's it. Imagining how Cornette took it when Vince came to talk to him and say, you're no longer creative. Keep this in mind. Cornette never said one word to me. Never cut a promo on me, never threatened me. You know when the trouble started? The day I left. He called my house when when I had I had three young kids. Okay. He left the voicemail on my phone, like literally threatening to kill me that my kids heard. My kids did not know Jim Cornette. They did not know who this guy was absolutely scared the shit out of them. He left that message with me and I called freaking Jim Ross. And I said to Jim Ross, I said, bro, cause, cause, cause Cornette reported to Ross and they were friends. I said, Jim, you better freaking call this guy off. I said, because I promise you, if you don't call him off, my next conver- my next conversation is going to be with an attorney and it's going to be a lawsuit against the WWE because I'm not going to be threatened by anybody. That was my next phone call. That's where it all began. So I was there for a long period of time before I left. He never said one single word to me to my face. I guess what we're left to believe, what we're left to assume is that Cornette's trying to keep his job. He's keeping his shit together and he holds it against you. This whole thing, you know, uh, seeing the, the decline of wrestling as he sees it, but also the lack of or the decrease of political power and influence he had. But the moment you're gone, he gives you a call. Yep. Now, yep. this is um, this is when you made the announcement before you started with WCW or it was right after you called Vince and said you're leaving. Yeah, af- after I called Vince and, and, and I went to WCW. And so Cornette calls you and it, it, it all comes out. It all comes yep. out. And yep. And yep. You're just yep. what was your reaction? Were you just completely you must have been surprised uh you, you're gonna leave this voicemail with me when we freaking work together for like two years following that we work together bro you never said anything to my face and now that i'm gone you're gonna leave me that type of 
that type of message, you're, 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 you're a weak, weak, weak man, bro. That's how I felt. Uh, so let's talk about those two years where there, you guys must've run into each other. Did you guys have pleasantries? Oh, we're, we're bro. We're, we're in every production meeting. We're in, every, we're, we're in a, a hundreds of meetings together, bro. If you guys happen to be standing next to each other at catering, would you nod at each other? Would you say, how's your day? Would you anything like that? Or I, I went about business like nothing happened. Like I just, you know, I was like, yeah, okay. Vince made the decision, whatever conversation they had, whatever role he put Cornette in, like I never thought twice about it. So I just went about like business as usual. Do you think that Cornette sees your, at this point, sees your biggest crime as, as he sees it, not just being someone who doesn't know anything about wrestling is contributing, but going to Vince behind your back, behind his back, so to speak, to get rid of him. Do you think he sees it? Like you went to him and you went to Vince and said, get rid of Cornette. Well, yeah, th- th- yeah. I mean, that that's what he wants to believe. I mean, he 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 doesn't want to take any responsibility whatsoever. That I was very stubborn. I was not going to change my ways. I I I carried myself that way in front of Vince. He's not going to take any responsibility for that. And plus, Matt, I'm I'm going to tell you what the underlining thing is. I'm from New York. That that had a lot to do with it. Jim Cornette is as southern as you can get, and he hates all New Yorkers with. A passion, bro. Bro, he despises anybody coming from the state of New York. Let's talk about that a little bit. I've heard you say that before. I've heard you say that you feel people from New York are despised. I am from Southern California. I've never noticed that or seen that. I have noticed that when people criticize you, they criticize your accent, the word choices you use, uh, the New York, you know, the bros and, and, and how you pronounce nine and those kind of things. But- well, what's, what's wrong with the way I say nine? <laughs> it sounds like Baba. What is that, man? man? Are you getting in? a little, a little slight there, Matt? If you, you, you know the Baba Booey thing where he's like, uh, my, uh, my personal life's a three, my professional life is a nine. Yeah. <laughs> it sounds a little bit, a little bit like that. But I've heard personally, firsthand, from Dutch Mantel. Yeah. And Dutch Mantel has said the exact same thing about you regarding yep. Southerners. Yep. Do you think? that there is a cultural disconnect between you and Jim Cornette that can't be bridged? Matt, my, my feeling towards Southerners was not there when I was working at WWE. My feeling and opinion of Southerners came when I moved to Atlanta. After WCW, I had my own business, bro. I had a CD warehouse in um, Atlanta and, you know, we sold, you know, CDs, used CDs, albums, VHS, DVDs, you name it. When Conan heard that I owned the CD warehouse, he thought I was storing CDs because it was a CD warehouse. (laughs) I, I, I digressed. When WCW came to an end, I had my CD warehouse in Atlanta. It was my job. I worked the, uh, I worked the counter. I was there every single day. My clientele was half white and half black. When whites and blacks were in my store at the same time and the black people would leave the shit, those what the, the shit, the white people would say about the black people. I never heard in my life. I'm a guy from New York, bro. I never heard that level of racism in my life. It was so freaking bad, bro. I did not like my kids are not growing up here. They're not growing up around this. They are not going to go to the same school as the children of these people. I had, I, I did, this is, this is 1999, 2000, 2001. I did not know racism to this level existed in the United States because in New York, I was not privy to that. And that's what turned me against the South. And it was every day. It wasn't one bad experience. It was every single day. 
That's what soured me on the South, living and working in that environment on a daily basis. So back to the New York thing. Um, what makes you say that Jim Cornette hates all New Yorkers, uh, not just you? Like, it, it, it's as simple as this. Like he, he, he would refer to me as a Yankee. And like I would have to tell Jim, like, Jim, you, you do know like – we have a baseball team called the Yankees. So like, I don't know if you understand this or not, but I don't know, like if you think that's offensive and you're calling me a Yankee and I'm, I'm going to be offended, but it was like shit like that. I didn't call Jim Cornette a redneck. I, I never referred to him as a freaking redneck. He used to call me a Yankee all the freaking time. What, what does that tell you? But do you think it was more of him trying to find little things about you? He didn't like, you know, just to say, well, this guy's got bad ideas, this friggin' Yankee, as opposed to him saying all Yankees are terrible and he's one of them. Nah, because Matt, he lived, you could ask Bruce this. He had to move to Connecticut. Oh my, you, 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 you might as well have told, you might as well have put him on death row. He hated Connecticut. He asked Bruce, I mean, Bruce will verify this. He cut promos on the East and Connecticut every single day. Day. I, I, I'm confident Bruce will verify that every day. So he leaves the phone call. Um, you're in WCW. When is, I guess, when is the next time you see Jim Cornette again? TNA. So explain that to me. Uh, you are already, who works with, who works for TNA first? You were Jim Cornette. Me. And so uh, you're approached by Jeff Jarrett and he says he's bringing Cornette in or he just shows up. No, no. He had a conversation with me. And what did uh, Jim Corn or what did Jeff Jarrett say to you? He goes, Vince, I want to bring in Jim because I honestly feel like the two viewpoints, you know, w which are so polar opposite. If I could get you guys to work together and I can get some of you and I can get some of him. I, I, I can maintain this. I can make this work. You know, you got to trust me. And I was like, Jeff, it's your company. Whatever you want to do, um, I will behave myself. Um, I will not have any anim uh, animosity. I will try to make this work. But my, my honest opinion is I don't think it will. But it's your company. You got to understand, bro. He was just starting TNA. I wanted it to succeed. So if he if he felt this was important, and if he felt that this this was a part of TNA succeeding, I'm not going to hold him. This is this is his company. This is his baby. This is his ass on the line, bro. If this is what you want to do, I'll give it a shot. In the years since the phone call where he left the message. Um, but and and the point where he got sprung into TNA, was there an escalating of feelings through you know I guess this is pre shoot interviews, but there was uh, you know internet and that kind of thing had had the feelings escalated between the two of you or was it pretty much Bro, you know, see, out of sight see, out Matt, of mind? Matt, I gotta correct you right there because like when you say had the feelings escalated between Matt, I had no ill will towards him. I, I was pissed off about freaking leaving that message and my kids getting it. And I was pissed off about that. And, you know, once I was over that, I was over it. It's over. I'm not working there anymore. We're never going to have to cross paths again. Like that's the end of it. So I did not hold any internal hostility because if I did, my my reaction to Jeff would have been, you're out of your effing mind, Jeff. Like, there's no way. I, I, I would have said to Jeff, it's either him or me. And, and by the same token, you have to imagine if Jeff Jarrett is approaching you, he's probably approaching Jim Cornette and saying, right. hey, you're going to have to work with Vince Russo. Right. Yep. So when was the first time that you laid eyes on Jim Cornette in TNA? I, I can't remember exactly, but there was never an issue. Never said any, again, this, this is the second opportunity you have, bro, to say never a crossword. I used to produce Jim Cornette in vignettes. We used to be in every production meeting together. He's still doing the same goofy shit. Hernandez was having a match with somebody where at the end of the match, I'm seeing freaking Hernandez foaming at the mouth like a rabid dog. 
So after the match, I go to Cornette. I'm like, what the F? Oh, yeah, Jim Cornette told me that uh, I, 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 I put some alka seltzers in my mouth. Because Jim Cornette wanted me to be foaming at the mouth. And I said, I said, Sean, have you ever seen a grown man like foam at the mouth? See, but he was still doing that stupid 70s, ridiculous shit. Now, you guys were having conflicts behind the scenes at TNA, though, right? No, not really. He, he wasn't a writer. He, he wasn't a writer of the show. He, he wasn't involved in the writing. The writing was me, Jeff, and Dutch. He, he, he was agent. He, a, a lot of his role was he was an on-air character and he was an agent. He was not involved in the creative process, so there, there were no issues. Jeff, Jeff did not make him a part of the creative process. It was me, Jeff, and Dutch. But there was a time where you guys were conflicting because a story that was told firsthand to me by Dutch was that there was a point in time where it appeared that you guys, your differences were an issue and uh, Jeff Jarrett brought you out to his house and had a meeting with you guys and said, if you guys wanted to settle it, you guys should physically fight. Is that, Oh my God, that, I, I mean, Matt, that never took place. Really? I, I mean, Matt, I, I love Dutch and I'm not saying <laughs> Dutch is lying. Right. That is preposterous. I mean, first of all, Jeff Jarrett knew me better than anybody Jeff would never suggest that I fight Jim Cornette. I mean, bro, that is that is uh, that is one thousand percent untrue. I don't I don't know what Dutch is thinking about, but my God, bro, absolutely not. I, I guess the story Dutch told was that uh, Jeff brought you guys to the house and said, "When I, you know, the way we handle things back in the day is we would all just go out and drive out in the field. We would have it out. We'd physically have it out, and then everything would be fine." But you're saying. That's not a conversation that took place. I don't even remember a meeting with Jim at Jeff's house. I, 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 I'm, listen, I'm not going to call Dutch a liar because, bro, a lot of time has passed and this and that. Bro, there is no – because, bro, there, there were no issues. Like there were no issues. He, Jim, it's not like it was me, me Vince, and, and, and Cornette. He was not a part of the creative process. The creative process was me, Jeff, and Dutch. So whatever he did as an agent, whatever he did, I mean, that was that that did not involve me. Um, at the time when when Cornette was doing, um, you know, what you call his goofy shit, and you're actually speaking up and you know talking to Hernandez and things like that, was there other occasions where you were telling people, "Wow, um, no, Cornette, I, no, 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 I, I would no, I, I would not do that. So I, you're not I mean, talking I, shit behind his no, back. No, that's not my mo. It, it was just like the 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 foam thing because I was like, what, like what? I, I literally asked him, like literally, like what was that? I didn't know, like what the like what was that? And that's when he explained it to me. So you and Cornette worked together peacefully during the time yes, of TNA? Yes, yes, absolutely. There, there were no issues. There were no problems. And I remember, like, specifically when Jeff got sent home, there, there's no buffer now. So I had to have a one-on-one -on -one with Jim and say, okay, bro, like, Jeff isn't here anymore. Like, we've we've got to try to make this work and it, and and it, and it was a um what's the word it was a civil conversation and it wasn't that much after that that Dixie sent Dutch and Jim Cornette home yes and was that the end of Jim Cornette's time in TNA yes and so that is the entire working relationship between you and Jim Cornette yes I remember there was like a, a, a meeting or a conversation, you know, where like she was now making me head of creative and like, you know, Jim Cornette, you know, and like Dutch Mantel were working there. And, you know, she said, you know, she said to me, well, Vince, how, how do you feel about those guys working here? And I said to her, the New England Patriots hire a new coach and but they keep the rest of the staff there. Dutch Mantel and Jim Cornette do not think along the same lines as I do. So like, quite frankly, th this would not be my team. And, and, you know, like Matt Conway, I was working with at the time, Matt was young. Uh, Matt was hip. Matt was looking at things much differently than I was. Cause he was a lot younger than me. I said, you know, M Matt's more of the future. Matt's more of where the business is heading. But like, if you're asking me 
would would I assign these guys on my team? No, I would not. And and and, and then Dixie made the decision that. Okay, they're gonna they're not gonna be working with the company. Cornette was still being used as a talent. Like I would never in a million years say don't use Jim Cornette. Now a couple of times, bro, I said, you know, this is two thousand and something. Jim Cornette can't go out there in a canary yellow suit, which he denied wearing, by the way, until somebody posted a picture of him in a canary yellow suit and said, no, Jim, you, you know. So like my thing was, he was a great mouthpiece. He was a great talker. I felt he had to update his style a little bit, but I would never eliminate a talent like that from the show. I was just basically talking about creative. But don't you think that canary yellow suit feeds into that Jim Cornette character, though? Uh, not, 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 not in the two thousands, Matt. I, I mean, in the two thousands, I mean, pe- people are looking at the show and they're saying, "Who is this goof? Like, what? Why? Why is this guy wearing a yellow suit?" I mean, no, nobody else is wearing a yellow suit. But and and that's what I mean. It's like what you said, the Jim Cornette character, bro. Everybody evolves with age. We all evolve with age. There should not be an exception with the Jim Cornette character. The Jim Cornette character should evolve in age like every other character. That's my opinion. Was there ever a, uh, you said you directed vignettes with him. Was there ever a point where you would give him direction or did you just kind of take a hands-off approach and let him do his own thing? Oh, no, I I didn't have to produce Jim Cornette. I mean, come on. I I, I would stand there to make sure it was done. Right. Yeah, I, I got him. I'm accountable for all the vignette. No, bro. Vince Russo ain't producing Jim Cornette. How easy was no. he to work with as a talent? 100, 1,000% easy. Okay, so. Never had an issue. Never, ever had an issue. Didn't produce him. Didn't need to. The guy's a pro. Do you think I, I just, I just got to make sure that they get done. I mean, that that's why I'm there. So post TNA post working together, those are your two working experiences together. Things escalated. Wait, let, let's stop right there. When uh, again, he's working with me at TNA for God knows how many years. Never says anything to my face. No, no, no crosswords. No, nothing. Okay. Dixie sends him home. He does the exact same thing he did at WWE, only this time it's in written form. And Terry Taylor, who was talent relations, he comes up to me. He goes, Vince, I've been really, really struggling with this, but you are my friend and, and I am, I'm, I'm, I'm worried about this and I need to share this with you. So now Terry shows me a letter that Jim Cornette wrote, wrote to him. And in the letter, Jim Cornette states, and I quote, if I, if I knew I could get away with it, I would kill Vince Russo. Okay. Terry now shows that letter to Dixie. Dixie, in turn, shows that letter to the Panda lawyers. The Panda lawyer contacts me and says, Vince, there is no way we are ever going to let any of our employees be threatened like this. There is no way we're going we're gonna to let him get away with this. He goes, this is a threat. It's on paper. This is serious. He goes, this is what I want to do. And I said, what? He goes, I want to fly Jim Cornette into Orlando under the guise that Dixie Carter wants to talk to him about rehiring him. Okay. As soon as he gets off the plane, I want to have him arrested for these threats. And I said to the guy, I said, I don't want to go down that road. All I want is the guy to freaking leave me alone. Like that's all I want, bro. Just leave me alone. And, 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 and that did not happen. Wow. So this is the story. Terry Taylor can verify that letter. JR can verify the voice message because I called JR and I told him about it. And JR took care of it. 
There was never another voice message. You know, what I'm inferring from your what you're saying is that you had a guy who hated you, hated you, hated you. Hated, hated, hated. I, I, I never, I never, I never witnessed such hate in my life. I never had hate for anybody like this in my life. Um, I, I never witnessed the level of hate like this in my life. He kept a lid on it while he had to. But meanwhile, we know that Cornette has a temper. We've seen it. So in keeping a lid on a temper, once you have the opportunity, once you have nothing else to lose, you can let loose. You can let that cathartic moment happen. The first time it's a phone call. The second time it's a uh, letter. In both cases, it's not just like, thank you, fuck you, goodbye, as he likes to say. It, these are physical yes. threats. These are threats. Yes. And for someone who is not old school wrestling like yourself, uh, who is not thinking this is hyperbole, you're taking this shit seriously. I, I, I don't think Jim Cornette is going to kill me. I, but, but a normal thinking, rational person does not write this kind of email. Did I think he was going to kill me? No. Jim Cornette's not going to kill me. But this this email was way over the line, Matt. So it, it was an email. It wasn't a letter. It was, it an, was email. an email. And, yes. It was and an it email. was an email he, he sent Terry Taylor yes. or he sent somebody Terry else? Taylor. Terry Taylor. Well, I think it's important to clear this up because people see it differently. I know I saw it differently. And I'm taking this all in. But I, you know, as more of a two-way street, of course, I think most people listening to a story say there's one side, there's the other side, and there's the truth in between. But from what you're saying, it sounds like this guy just absolutely hated you, kept a lid on it. Once he was able to, he let loose. And now we're at a point where you say, leave me alone. And then you kind of start hearing some stuff here and there, right? What do you mean? What, 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 what do you mean? Well, it's not like he stays quiet about you. I'm not really paying attention, though. I'm, I'm not really paying attention. And the reason why I'm not paying attention, Matt, is because I'm wrapped up in my job. You, you, you know what I mean? Like, I'm still working at TNA. You know, th there's the Hulk thing. There's the Eric thing. I'm, I'm dealing with all that shit. So, quite frankly, bro, while I'm working at TNA, like, I'm really not monitoring what he's doing or what he's saying that much because at that point like there are other issues to deal with let's get to what everybody wants to talk about which is we i got a in my i have a group of wrestling fans and a couple wrestling insiders um you know a group chat and it said fucking russo took out a restraining order on jim Cornette. that is crazy russo's lost his mind so Explain to me the sequence of events that lead up to you feeling the need to have a restraining order against Jim Cornette. About four years ago, I get into podcasting full time. Okay, bro. So as I get into podcasting full time and I become a part of that world, I know Jim Cornette's got his Jim Cornette experience on MLW. Okay, bro. So now through social media, I get on Twitter for the first time. I'd never been on Twitter for the first, the whole nine yards. Like I'm literally hearing like every freaking show. Vince Russo is the topic. Okay. Every show it's, it's the Vince Russo show, Matt, when does this stop? Like, you know, at, at this point, Jim, like we're both in our mid fifties, like, when does, when does this end? Like, when does this stop? So Jim, I mean, Matt, I never, I ignored him. I, I'm thinking to myself, if you ignore him, he'll go away. He didn't go away. It was like, a, it was like a one-sided war. This wasn't a war of words. He was doing shows and saying shit about me and burying me every single day. <clears throat> I said nothing. Nothing, bro. Thinking this guy will go away. No, he's not. He's not going away. Finally, bro, my mother passes away. <clears throat> he says something on his show about my dead mother. So now I get a call about a very from a very good friend of mine by the name of Vito Lagrasso who I've known since 1991. And Vito says, this is, it's, this, this is over the line. 
to uh, talking about your freaking mother now, bro. Like you've got to say something. And I said, Vito, like, what, 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 what is that going to do? I mean, what, what is that going to do? <clears throat> so Vito says to me, he goes, Vince, you're a writer. He says, bro, use your head. He goes, do a video in a funny entertainment comedic way where like, you know, you bury the guy, but you bury him like in a funny, entertaining way that you can do. Okay. So I said, okay, Vito. So I, I do this promo, which I thought was very funny and very entertaining. And I'm like, okay, Jim, I get it. <clears throat> you know, you want me to, uh, I owe you an apology. Okay, Jim. And then I start a list of what I'm sorry for. I, I apologize. You blew out your knees on the scalpel match because you are Mark and didn't know how to take a bump. I apologize, you know, like, you know, what I had like a list of apology things that, that were all funny, entertaining. There was no me cutting a promo. There was no F you F this. No, no, that's not what I, what I did. It was entertaining. It was funny. It got like over half a million downloads, bro. This set him off to the next level. So he went right back and it was another threatening, violent, um, response. Okay. Matt, here's the difference. This wasn't Vince Russo living in Colorado and Jim Cornette living in Louisville. Vince Russo was now living in Evansville, Indiana. Okay. Which is about an hour from Louisville. Vince Russo is living in a log cabin in the freaking woods. So now we're talking about 60 minutes away from this lunatic. Okay. Okay. No problem. Still saying, bro, he's not going to do nothing. He's not going to do nothing. He's not going to do nothing. Okay, bro. I get a call from Kenny Bolin. Kenny Bolin is Jim Cornette's best friend, lifetime friend of Jim Cornette since they were kids. Kenny calls me and says, Vince, uh, I'm calling you because I'm very, very concerned. There were some things Jim said in a personal conversation with me where he alluded to to sending some people to your house. And Kenny Bolin says to me, Vince, I'm telling you as your friend, it was serious enough where I think you need to file a restraining order. Okay. So Matt, the first thing that's going through my mind is I know there are a lot of crazy people out there. I know my house is in the woods, bro. The, I didn't have a driveway. I had a dirt road up to my house. Okay. I know I'm not home all the time. And, and all I'm seeing, bro, is like a freaking pickup driving down the third road with my wife home alone by herself. That's all that I'm seeing. I called my brother-in-law. I call my brother-in-law who is heavily, heavily, heavily into guns. And I said, Jeff, I said, I got this situation. I said, bro, you got, you got to give me one of your guns. He came to my house with a shotgun showing me how to do, I, I, bro, I never had a gun in my hands before. So, bro, I'm literally standing and my wife doesn't know. My wife's in the house. I'm standing out with my brother-in-law by his car. He's showing me how to cock this shotgun and everything. And I'm standing there and I'm saying, how did, how did, it, how did we get here? Like, how, how, how did it get to this where, like, I, I, I'm thinking I'm going to have to shoot somebody to freaking protect my wife? Like, how, how did we ever get to this point? So that was when I decided, you know what? I'm going to take the advice of Kenny Bolin. I'm going to go down to the courthouse. I'm going to re I'm going to file a restraining order 
because God forbid something happens to me or something happens to my wife, I want Jim Cornette to be the very first person they go to. And that's why I filed the restraining order. Your overriding emotion at this time was fear. Absolutely. And not fear of Jim Cornette. His fan base, his fan base hates me as much as he do. He has convinced his fan base that I am the freaking devil. And all it would have taken would be one freaking lunatic, you know, to, 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 to get it, to get name recognition, to show, Hey Jim, look, look what I did for you. I literally, Matt, I had eyes behind my freaking head. It wasn't just privately. Uh, Jim Cornette had said that, you know, if he could kill you and get away with it, he would. You know, um, that is something that's, you know, out there. It's not just in, a, in an email. It's, it's out there. And, and, and here's another thing. Let me, let me say this too, Matt. I, I, again, I want to make this perfectly clear. Matt. He, he, here's the second time. This guy gets the restraining order. He makes a joke about it. He's autographing them and selling them, but under the guise of half of the money's going to charity. If I would have went to a district attorney and said, bro, like, look at what this guy is doing. But again, no, I don't. I, I just want him to go away. That's all I want. Go away. I'm not going to be doing this with you when I'm 70, bro. Go away. Looking at it from his viewpoint just a little bit, you know, he's he's really upset at you. He dislikes you a lot. He's talking a lot of shit. He's challenged you to public fights for $5,000, the whole thing. Um, all of this is documented. All of this is on videos of him saying it. Can we, can we talk about the public fights too? There's something very important here, Matt. Matt, I drove in a car with Jim Cornette one time. One time. Okay? He's in the driver's side, bro. I'm in the passenger seat. Somebody passes Jim Cornette on the road. Person passes him. Now he's speeding up. We come to a red light. We're on a red light. By the way, the person that passed him was a woman. Okay? Jim Cornette reached under his seat and took out a gun. And he showed the gun to the lady and waved the gun to the lady. And that freaking lady took off like scared for her freaking life. So you, you understand you really think I've seen this guy pull a gun on a freaking woman. You, you, you think I'm going to meet Jim Cornette for a fight. Oh yeah. And, and then bro, what, what, what happens when I get the best of Jim Cornette in a fight? God forbid I beat him. First of all, if I beat him now, there's no saving face. What do you do at that point? Like, are you freaking kidding me? You're not going to, you're not going to go to your car and get a gun and take it to the next level. We're not dealing with a rational person. And man, I even said, this guy is the advocate cauliflower alley club, Jim, no problem. Let's you and me meet in an open forum with a moderator. We, we put it on I pay per view. And we raise money, bro. All the money goes to the Cauliflower Alley Club. What about that? Oh, no, I'll, 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 I'll meet you with a baseball bat and I'll give you five. Like, what, 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 what are we, freaking animals here? Come on, man. This, this is not a rational human being, bro. He's not rational. Keeping that in mind, you know, we're only responsible for what we're responsible for, right? And you know, already you say this is a guy who's not rational. Looking back, making the videos, uh, being funny about it, you know, the banana, the whole thing that, you know, you talked about being sorry for all this stuff. That was a mistake, right? It was a mistake, Matt, but that it, it wouldn't have mattered. It, like it, the, the, it, it wouldn't have mattered. Should I have probably not done that? Yes, I should have probably not done that. He, he's, he's not going away, bro. Like it, it, it would have been something else. 
it, I guess pride got the better of you, where you felt like you had to yeah. say something, and, and you have your friend yes. Vito. Yeah, I, I mean, talking about my dead mother. I mean, I mean, c- come on, bro. Like seriously, looking at it from his viewpoint, just a little bit, just just a little bit. Uh, devil's advocate here. Here's a guy who's just talking shit, old school wrestling. He's mad at you. He means you no harm. Uh, like he's never gonna follow through. He just is blowing off steam. No, st- stop. I, you got. I got to stop you with the means you no harm. That Terry Taylor email. It was. It was scary. Like it was. It. It was like this was not a normal thinking human being. This. This email was concerning. But I guess what I'm saying is from your viewpoint. From 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 you receiving it. I'm saying from from Jim Cornette's viewpoint. Maybe he's just blowing off steam. He has no intention yeah, of ever doing maybe, anything. Yes, yes, and then he yes. gets a restraining order. And yes. You get a restraining order. He's like, what the fuck is it with this guy now? He doesn't. He can't take some talk. Can you see where people outside the situation or people who are fans of Jim Cornette think that Vince Russo overreacted at all? I'm not taking any chances when my wife's involved. Yeah, you know, bro, if I was in Colorado, that restraining order would have never happened. When I'm in driving distance, bro, and your listeners are listening to what Vince is, you know, to what you're saying about Vince every day, and I have a log cabin in the woods and it's just me and my wife, no neighbors in sight or anything, bro, I am not taking any chances. Right, because the restraining order, as you put it, was for the purpose of documentation because yes. if you're in the log cabin in the woods, there'd be yes. no witnesses. No one would know what yes. happened. So yeah, and they would they would go, oh wait, oh but wait, hold on, wait a minute, he's got a restraining order against this guy. And so you're at that state of mind where you think something's actually going to happen, and yes. that's why you get the restraining order for documentation. But the fact that it was an hour away, and the fact that he told Kenny Bolin, it's not going to be me. But I'm going to send somebody. And he, here's the he, here's the way he said it to Kenny. I'm going to send somebody to Vince's house to take care of him. That's what he said to that. That's what Kenny Bolin said to me. Kenny Bolin, Kenny Starmaker Bolin, was an OVW talent who was brought in by Jim Cornette because they're longtime, long, longtime friends. It it became uh, apparent. Uh, not too long ago that there was a falling out between the two as he started appearing on your shows. Was him telling you what Cornette said, the reason that him and Cornette fell out? Uh, no, it was, it was prior to that. It was like, Kenny, like, kept asking me like to come on his show. I knew he was like Cornette's friend. And I'm like, I'm not going to come on your show and a- have you ambush me. And he was like, no, my, my son's a big fan of yours, this, that, and the other thing. I'm not going to do that. I wound up going on Kenny's show and, and me and Kenny like became friends. Kenny, Kenny had a show on my, on my podcast for a while that the first time I appeared on Kenny Boland's show, like they were done. So Cornette saw it as, uh, going to the other side. Yes. And so it was after that point that he heard Cornette say that personally o- over dinner. Cornette told him that personally, not publicly. It was a personal conversation between the two. But I guess what I'm saying is, you know, I know you're not great with timelines, but him, uh, Cornette telling Kenny Bolin that was after you appeared on Kenny Bolin's show? Yeah, yeah, it it, it was after I appeared on Kenny Bolin's show. So it probably was a conversation that took place having to do with him being on, or you guys forming a friendship and saying, listen, this motherfucker here, I'm going to send someone. I'll tell you about Vince Russo. No, no, no. That 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 conversation between Kenny and and um, that conversation between Kenny and Jim took place after my video. That that video set him off. That that video is what set him off. That conversation took place after that video. <laughs> so I guess it, it 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 kind of does belabor the point that. You know, your pride, you know, and I don't think we can blame you, but the pride got in the way where you said, I don't give a shit. I'm going to say something back to him. But at the same time, you definitely, you can't win. It, it, it was more like, it was more like, man, my, 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 my frame of mind is like, bro, this is so ridiculous. Like, I'm just going to make you look stupid. Right. That, that was really my frame of mind. I'm, I'm just going to make 
make you look like an idiot. I, I mean, really, that was my frame of mind. But there's no winning. It's like in the movie Bat- no. Batman where he says some people just want to watch the world burn. Yeah. Yeah. And, and man, let, 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 let's face it, man. I've become a part of his folklore. His his Vince Russo's, it, it's shtick, bro. It, it's shtick. It, it's, it, it's what he does. It's part of his stand-up act. It's part of his routine. He's painted a picture of hating me so much. He could never go back now because in his mind, like what would his fans say? What would his followers say? He could never go back. So like it's become shtick. We're going to talk about it every day. I'm going to find, I'm going to, I'm going to find one thing Russo said and do a whole show about it. But it's like, Jim, like we're, 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 we're 58 year old men. Like, does, does this ever, when does this stop, bro? Like, when does it just stop? It good. That's a, that is the question. And, and Matt, you do know, let me, let me add one, let me add one other thing just so people know again, cause I want to make things clear with a restraining order, bro, that a, a judge had to hear the case. I showed the judge the transcript of his podcast and the judge read that transcript and he, 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 agree, he approved the, the, uh, restraining order, but with the restraining order, bro, it's like, he cannot come within so much feet of me. If I wanted to, I could get myself booked at every appearance Jim Cornette is getting himself booked at where Jim Cornette is making money. I could book myself at every one of those events and he would not be able to go. I I, I literally could call a promoter and say, hey, bro, you got a convention. It's so, hey, bro, guess what? I'll, I'll do it for free. I'll come down and show, I'll sell eight by tens. He won't be able to go. Bro, that's not what this is about. What this is about is like, bro, leave me the F alone. Uh, enough. Right. You know? Can I tell you what a fucking bad idea that would be <laughs> to do that? But but your point is made that it's not a grandstanding thing. And it's not like Vince Russo signed his own restraining order. A judge deemed it worthy of it being a restraining order. Yeah, no, 1,000%. Um, so when we get to this, let's go ahead and get to the crux of it, which is the, f- I don't want to use the word funny, but it is really the basis of what my dislike of Vince Russo was, what Jim Cornette's dislike of Vince Russo is, what a lot of people's so-called dislike of Vince Russo is. At the crux of it, it's a it's a difference of wrestling philosophy. Like all this comes down to, you think wrestling should be one way. He thinks it should be the other way. And now some real world shit is coming to play. Restraining orders, threats, having your in-law come over and bring a gun over. How insane is that to you that at the very core of this is just a creative difference? Well, it, it, it's a little bit more than that, Matt. And it goes right back to what I said last week. Remember when I said, bro, when you got guys like Jarrett and Pritchard and Bischoff that were embedded in the wrestling business and embedded in the wrestling bubble. Every time you're dealing with people like this, you know they have an agenda. They have an angle. How is this going to benefit them? I mean, you know that going in. There's no regard to the real world. In the wrestling bubble with Jim Cornette, you know, it's okay to, it, it's okay to leave messages where I'm going to kill you and your kids are going to listen to. It's okay, bro, to, to write Terry Taylor an email that, oh my, if I could get away with killing Vince Russo, I'd kill him. It's, it, it's okay, bro, to do a podcast about somebody's dead mother. It's okay to, to threaten. I'm going to have somebody, you know, visit Vince Russo and pay him a visit. All those are acceptable and okay in the wrestling bubble, bro. They're not acceptable in the real world. I, I, I live in the real world, bro. I live in the real world, bro, where there are rules, there are regulations, there are laws, there are, there's a certain way you conduct yourself that I live in that world. 
I don't live in your bubble, bro, where anything goes and you can say and do whatever you want without there being any ramifications. I don't live in that world. That's why I don't work in the wrestling business anymore. I will say that with the wrestling bubble thing, it's very true. You know, and we talked about that last week, but Bruce Pritchard, Jeff Jarrett, Jim Ross ain't going to do any of those things. This, this is a Jim Cornette issue. Right. Absolutely. Eric Bischoff ain't doing that. Eric, Eric Bischoff ain't going to do any of those. Eric Bischoff does not like me. He's not, you know, he, Eric Bischoff's not, not going to go to that extent. There's a, I mean, there's a better chance of you having a beer with Eric Bischoff than Bischoff ever threatening your life. Yeah, absolutely. And bro, and he's like, he, here's the, here's the thing, Matt, like, that's like, bro, you know, the, 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 the gimmick I told you about the gun with, with the woman and everything. Right. Right. Bro, he's denied that ever happened. He, he, he said, I'm lying about that. You know, the stories, him, him beating up somebody's car with a baseball bat over a camera, him, him choking out freaking Santino, who did, Santino Morello he slapped Santino in the face, right? Him getting fired from ring of honor because he, you know, he threw a tirade there. There are stories beyond Vince Russo. There's an entire history here, you know, and, and, and also Anybody, if you've seen the Dairy Queen incident on YouTube, a lot of this, uh, you know, really falls into uh, character with a lot of stuff we've seen with Jim Cornette. So with that, let's put this issue to bed. Unless Mr. Cornette wants to come on the show, you know, you said you'd even maybe do a boxing match if it went to Cauliflower Alley, but I think that would be the worst fight in the world. So let's let's scrap that one. But if there ever wants to be a public forum. You know, you can bring me, he can bring Brian Laster, however he wants to do it. It's an open invite, but what we don't want is an escalation. This show was not to bury Jim Cornette. This show was to tell the history of you and Jim Cornette. Bro, how could I, how could I bury Jim Cornette when I have said on numerous occasions, um, I think he is a very, very, very talented guy. I, I, I wish I could cut a promo like Jim Cornette. On a promo scale, Cornette's a 10 and I'm maybe a 3 compared to him. Bro, at the end of the day, I'm going to say the same thing that I said since he left that message on my phone in 1999. All I want the guy to do is leave me alone. Bro, I'm going to be 58 in a couple of months. I'm not going to do this with you when I'm 60, bro. Like, I'm just not. There's no reason to believe we can't just let it go because this has been a chance for you to get the whole story out there as you see it. We're not asking anybody to troll him or at him, any of that stuff. Let's let this story speak for itself. If he wants to respond, he can respond. We are truth with consequences. Vince Russo's truth with consequences. Here's what I really feel bad about, and and I hope you understand this. You, you, just by doing this show, are going to now, you're going to feel the wrath of Jim Cornette. I'm telling you right now, bro. You, you, you are going to, and that's unfortunate. I, and I really, I apologize to you for that because I don't wish that on anybody, but bro, I'm, I'm just telling you, you are going to get that wrath now. If someone who I'm a fan of, you know, outside of what I've heard today, Jim Cornette feels the need to do that. That's completely fine. I just know that we have done a great show today. You know, it's just wrestling to me. So uh, when this show's over, I have to go and teach some music lessons. So I think if Jim Cornette finds me worthy enough to, to talk about, I'm 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 honored. <laughs> so uh, hey, real quick though, we have a great show for next week. Of course, by the time next Matt, show comes out, can I interrupt out, you for sure. a second, Matt? You know, I got ADD. I got to jump right yeah. in there. Oh, me too. Me too. I I'm I'm getting a feeling with you like there's a lot of like sub because you're a very intelligent man. Would you agree with that? I, I I'd like to think so. <laughs> there's, I think I think there's a lot of subliminal jabs at me because I think you think maybe I'm Vince ain't that clever. <laughs> Vince ain't gonna pick this up. I think that's what you're doing. I think that's how you're getting over with your dirt sheet buddies. Okay, bro. Hey guys, did you? I, I think when you hang up, this when we, when this airs, I think you're gonna give Keller the call. Hey, hey, wait. Did you see the shirt I wore on Vince's podcast? <laughs> Show everybody the shirt, Matt. Okay, so this is a StarCast shirt. Yeah, and this the is not, StarCast not- <laughs> that I was banned from, Matt. 
and Here's... my co-host <laughs> is wearing a t-shirt, bro. So it, it, it's even worse than that. First of all, this is a StarCast staff shirt. There's a couple subliminal things going on that have always been going on. In the back here, uh, I have my Bruce Pritchard original drawing that was only, only four people have this. Um, myself, Dave Silva, Bruce Pritchard, and Conrad Thompson. That was given to me as a gift by Conrad. And below that, I have <laughs> I have my Cody Rhodes cigars. Um, and so I have my Cody Rhodes cigars. And this is something we're going to talk about one day. Of course, I have my Ric Flair pop I just got yesterday for uh, W2K19. But next to Ric Flair, I have my favorite wrestler in WWE today. And I don't think you can see it. Do you know who my favorite wrestler in WWE today is, Vince? I know, I know what you're doing. Sami Zayn. <laughs> I just want you to know, as long as you know, I'm, 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 I'm smartened up with you. I just want you to understand. That. But at the same time, um, thank you once again for for a great episode. And let's talk about um, let's talk about next week's show because by the time next week's show airs, we would have seen hopefully <laughs> the return or maybe the return of Shawn Michaels. So what I'm thinking is next week we cover the career of Shawn Michaels from after Montreal. We're not going to cover Montreal, but after Montreal, all the way through uh, the WrestleMania with Stone Cold. So just that little six-month period of Shawn Michaels, everything that's going on in the WWE at that time, all the way leading to him uh, retiring, um, and all the DX stuff, everything leading into that. How does that sound for an episode next week? Oh God, I got um, man, I got, I got again, man. There is so much Shawn Michaels stuff I have never spoken about before. Um, I mean, that will blow your mind. I'm gonna give you a little tease, Matt. I mean, again, bro, you know, um, there were a time, there was a time, uh, right in the thick of things that Shawn and Vince were not speaking to each other, and Vince Russo was the go between. And, uh, you know, again, like I, I was there, like I, I was the go between bro. It was, it was ugly. And, uh, there are a lot of things to talk about. It's a fascinating period to me because of the way that Shawn Michaels left his condition at the time, his injury, which a lot of people have questions about. Um, and of course what his demeanor was, where his place was in the company with the ascent of Stone Cold Steve Austin and also in the wake of Montreal. It's a fascinating part of wrestling history that I think doesn't get talked about. And you were there. Yes, I was there. And I had a, my last conversation with Sean was probably maybe two years ago. And uh, something very, very, very pertinent came out of that conversation, which I want to talk about. Vince, this was an awesome episode. Thank you once again. And anything else you want to say to close out today? Yeah, no, my absolute goal, bro, is, you know, my absolute goal um, is to make peace with Jim Cornette. The the hostility is not on my end, bro. I, I don't carry grudges. I don't hold grudges. The, you know, I say the same thing to Jim Cornette that I say to Eric Bischoff. Bro, I want peace with you guys. Like, we're getting older. And it's exactly what Matt says, bro. It's freaking wrestling. I just be, I'm not going to do this with you, bro. I'm, I'm somebody's grandfather, bro. It's just wrestling. And that is my goal, bro. My goal is for peace.